being generated by the main body of the comet. And so if you picture a comet in your mind, but to only do this for the moment, listening audience, because in an hour from now, we're going to shatter this paradigm. If you picture the notion of a snowball uh, that NASA has told us that comets are, muddy snowballs traveling through space, and in their interaction with the solar wind, that snowball is slowly melting, which produces the tail that we're familiar with seeing on comets. That's the official story here to date. The coma is the, the mass that is around the body itself. It does not factor in the length of the tail. And the current estimate of the diameter of the coma is 80,000 kilometers, 80,000. That's quite large. That is quite large. And for it to be that far away from the sun, uh, it, it doesn't make any, if it would be outgassing that much, you would not see the structure of the head that you're seeing right now. That head. Right, right. Please, please continue, yes. A coma like that. I, I, Dr. Agnew, I, I, I wasn't able to hear uh, just the, could you rephrase, uh, restate uh, your last comment? Uh, well, it sounds like we're, uh, it sounds like we're, uh, uh, there it is. Okay, we're experiencing Dr. Agnew's cell phone outage now. So, uh, to, to kind of, yet. there we have it. Dr. Agnew, I, I think you're, you're fading in and out for us just a bit. Um, well, I, I'm, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what that's what we'll do. I, 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 I'm, I'm just the the point that I'm trying to make is that if 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 Comet Elenin was already off gassing as far away from the sun as it is right now, then that leads me to believe that the head is has to be a lot larger than a couple kilometers across. Right. Yes. Yes. And uh, as a matter of fact, also, I'm, I'm grabbing one additional piece of information here that's even more updated. Uh, as of May 21st, the fresh estimate of the size of the coma exceeds 100,000 kilometers. Now, I think it, it's incumbent upon us to provide some sense of scale or scope to people to understand the significance of this. The diameter of the Earth is approximately 6,000 kilometers. And so if we're looking at the coma exceeding 100,000 kilometers, we are, in fact, an order of magnitude much larger than the Earth. But we, we don't want to confuse that the coma is not the same as the body of the object itself. According to the uh, traditional manner of thinking about comets, it is the debris field, if you'd like to consider it that way, that surrounds the, uh, the core of the object. Um, am I doing okay so far with my, my depiction of this, Dr. Agnew? Yeah, yeah, I think so. See, you, you kind of have in space, you know, there's not a whole lot of gravity that keeps these things together, and it really doesn't take much if you're a free-floating body in space, which, which a comet ostensibly is. But uh, when, once they start getting hot, and I, and I mean above absolute zero is going to be, you know, warm enough to start boiling some of these gases off, uh, then, then the diameter of the visible diameter of it, the, what's, what's sort of like a swarm of bees coming through space, is going to start showing up. It's going to start, you know, making a trail that we can see with, with our scopes. But uh -huh. um, again... I, I, I just got to tell you, this thing is so far away from the sun still that it doesn't make any sense that it would be off-gassing uh, that much. The other, the other theory is that this thing is a brown dwarf. Uh -huh. uh, pe people got to understand that a brown dwarf is, is a dead sun. It's, it's a star that used to be, you know, have explosive forces balanced against the gravity of its own density, a lot like our sun. And then over time, all the fuel gets used up or all the hydrogen gets converted into helium. And so the explosive force goes away. The gravitational force takes over and it begins to cool off and crunch down into much uh, tighter uh, gravitational fields. So it's maybe one-tenth or one-fiftieth its original size. It's not sure. big enough to become a black hole or a, a neutron star, but it cools off and, and can become a brown dwarf. If that's the case, 
It's not going to off-gas at all. It has so much gravity, nothing is going to off-gas as it comes close to our sun. So that's why I don't think that it is a brown dwarf. But it is something with structure. And it is something that is tr- is coming from a an origin in space that's completely unique, yes, not yes. a comet. And I, I actually in, intend fully that we'll spend uh, not, not less than the entire second half of the program, the final hour, discussing in quite, uh, quite a lot of uh, theoretical detail just exactly what that something might be. Uh, the one theory uh, that NASA wants us to think is that it's uh, nothing more than a, a typical comet. Uh, Dr. Agnew, you just uh, sold a little bit of my thunder, but, but uh, certainly have caused no uh, anguish uh, that the idea of some that hold that it's a brown dwarf star. There's at least one other theory to throw out quickly and as a way of setting a bit of a teaser. It might be a planet. It may be a planet that a lot of folks are familiar reading about, uh, has a familiar name, but we're, we're going to return to that after a bit as well. I'd like to further paint the picture of how Elenin is going to continue its path through our solar system uh, to give folks some sense of timing, some scale. Uh, it's expected to come to perihelion, which is its closest approach to the sun, on the 10th of September of this fall. So just, just a couple of months away, folks. At that time, it will be at a distance of 0.4824 astronomical units. Now, for the listening audience, if you're not already familiar, one astronomical unit represents the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And so when Elenin makes its closest approach, its perihelion to the Sun, it will be at one half the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Am, am I on track so far, Dr. Agnew? Well, if it's, if it's, yeah, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is approximately 93 million miles, depends on the time of year. Uh, so if it's going to be less than one astronomical unit, it's going to be, you know, less than 93 million miles away from Earth. Approximately half that, in fact, right? Uh, so it would be 40, uh, 46,500 approximately. It's that, that, that's about the same distance as Mars. Yeah, yes. And e- even more interesting, I think, is that on six, uh, the 16th, 1-6 of October, the comet will pass within the Earth at a distance of 0.233 astronomical units. So that is less than one quarter of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Exactly. So now, now you're talking something like 20 million miles. And in fact... That's like uh, half, half the distance between the Earth and Mars. Yes, yes, quite right. And in fact, Elenin is not taking a leisurely stroll through our solar system. It's expected that at the time it passes uh, at its closest point to the Earth, the relative velocity will be 86,000 kilometers per hour, which is nearly as fast as my good friend in Illinois drives. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, it, it's, it's relatively uh, uh, quick. No, Earth goes through its orbit at about 18 miles a second. Yes. And uh, what's, what's interesting, uh, you know, folks are familiar by now with science fiction movies, hearing about using uh, planetary uh, gravitational fields for a slingshot effect. And it, that's, that's actually what uh, Elenin will experience as well. After it makes its circuit around the sun, it accelerates, right, due to the slingshot effect? Yes. And what I think is interesting is that uh, our discussion thus far has been focused on Elenin, and yet Elenin's not alone. It has another cometary uh, friend, maybe it's a distant cousin, uh, that, that's going to be in the neighborhood also passing through. Of course, oh, I've heard interesting of stuff. Com- you, Com- you, Com- 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 45P, Honda, Mercos, and I sure can't pronounce the name of that final astronomer. He must be Czechoslovakian. That happens on October the 8th, the morning of October the 8th. Ellen and, and Comet 45P, Honda, make their closest approach to one another uh, before apparently moving close to and in front of Mars on October 15th. Any thoughts here so far? Well, you see, the thing that there there are a lot of um, probabilities that are uh, estimated when when we talk about uh, bodies moving through space at that kind of speed, you know, roughly ten times the speed of Earth uh, as Earth is going around the sun. 
Uh, each body that moves through space uh, warps space-time. It, it, Earth moving through space uh, warps space-time. The sun uh, revolving around the center of our galaxy warps space-time. Even a, a jetliner uh, traveling you know, across the United States makes a gravitational wave. The faster a body travels through space, uh, it, it, it intensifies that gravitational effect. It's a lot like the, the wake. Mass, of a, it, I think it's a lot like the wake that's left behind by uh, a craft uh, going traveling through the water. Is that right? Yes, it's a, it's a lot like that, except we're actually talking about the, the the fabric of space time. In other words, if light were to shine from one point to another, we would assume it would go in a straight line, and ordinarily it would. But actually, it's following the threads of space-time. So mm -hmm. as space-time warps, the length of light or the speed of light changes. And so the further out these things are, the, the data points are so close to one another, it's difficult to extrapolate. That is to say, uh, if you had a 12-foot a, a tape measure and you took a few measurements, and then you decided to guess at how far away that bridge is based on the few measurements that you've taken with your 12-foot tape measure. You could get close, but it's, it's, it's not – you don't have enough data points to make an, an accurate extrapolation. And so supercomputers are really trying to estimate – you know, how, what is the exact path of this? What is the exact gravitational effect that this is going to have upon Earth, upon the moon, upon yes. uh, the other planets in our solar system? Well, there just aren't enough data points to make an accurate prediction. We can get a general prediction, but the more data points that we put together, the more and more these things narrow down, and we begin to be able to make accurate predictions. Now, Quite the right. real question is, when do we know it, and what do we do when we do know it? Yes, if I can, if I can offer two words here, orbital eccentricity. Ellenon has been exhibiting orbital eccentricity. Now, what does that mean? Well, everyone knows their eccentric old aunt that wears incredibly strange clothes and has pets no one else does. Well, orbital eccentricity is the unpredictability that's happening with objects. And Ellen has is, is, uh, been exhibiting quite, uh, quite uh, uh, a noteworthy orbital eccentricity thus far. And in fact, I think bridging to your comments about the wake that it's leaving of warped space-time, uh, just in case anyone is wondering about that, I know folks in Missouri, it's the show me state, they always like to uh, have something tangible to touch and feel. Uh, do a web search, NASA, Einstein, probes, and you'll have access to information about a sequence, a series of experiments that have been conducted by NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratory to measure, to ascertain how space-time is warped and or wrinkled around uh, planetary bodies uh, due to their uh, gravitational effects. Uh, you can read for yourself uh, quite a lot of detail about these probes that have been done. Uh, even in and around the Earth, and that will help further support Dr. Agnew's comments regarding the uh, uh, warp in uh, the field, the wake, once again, if you will, that uh, is left uh, in the wake of Ellen as it passes through. But it's orbital eccentricity, Dr. Agnew. Can we talk about that for a little bit? Sure. Uh, there, in, in astrophysics, one of the theories that has been used for a long, long time to try to discover the presence of other planets is a theory called perturbation theory. This is where we, we can't really see planets because they don't put off light, but we can see the stars. So we watch the star and we see how it wobbles. We see its eccentricities. And then we can make guesses about the body that's tugging on that star as it's going around. And that's, that's the method we use to find planets for a long, long time. And guess what? <laughs> we didn't find very many. We, uh, if we're lucky enough to see the star wobble because the planet's moving in a plane where we can see the star move 